Hi everyone. Welcome to this presentation of why it is it is raining in my surgery suit. Desiccant dehumidification in the healthcare setting. I am Shalin Kasira from Mashir Rajasthan chapter. I welcome Mr. R. Mark Nunelli as a distinguished lecturer. Today we Ashray India chapter, Ashray Rajasthan chapter and Ishre Delhi chapter are jointly organizing this virtual presentation. I would like to read the Ashray Code of Ethics first. In this and all other Ashray meetings, we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, competence, inclusiveness, and respect for others, which exemplify our core values of excellence, commitment, integrity, collaboration, voluntaries, and diversity, and shall avoid all real or perceived conflict of interest. Ashray, founded in 1894, is a global society advancing human well-being through sustainable technology for the built environment. The society and its members focus on building systems, energy efficiency, indoor air quality, refrigeration, and sustainability within the industry through research, standards writing, publishing, and continuing education. Ashray shapes tomorrow's built environment today. Ashray is celebrating 125 years of shaping the built environment. Become a member of Ashray by visiting ashray.org. So today we have a, a distinguished lecturer, Mr. R. Mark Nuleli. He's a mechanical engineering graduate of Urban University, a registered professional engineer and a lead accredited professional. Nuleli is also certified as a commissioning authority through the AB, AABC commissioning group. He has been involved in the construction engineering and HVAC industry since 1982. Since 2000, his professional interest in projects have primarily pertained to commissioning, retro commissioning, humidity control consulting, and energy management for commercial, institutional, and industrial buildings. He has presented numerous training seminars on commissioning, dehumidification technologies, and their applications as well as psychometries and designing for proper humidity control. He has been a member of Ashray since 1985. Nelly is a past president of the Birmingham chapter as served as chairman for the society's membership promotion committee and has served on the environmental health committee for the society. Mr. Nelly is also recognized as one of the Ashray's distinguished lecturers and also conducted training seminars both domestically and internationally. So today he would like to talk about why it is raining in my surgery suit. Is it raining in your operation operating rooms? Are the surgeons requesting cooler temperatures than the HVAC system was designed to maintain under the AIA guidelines? This is the common complaint being heard throughout many hospitals today, especially throughout the southern climate regions. This presentation will give the attendees a better understanding of the causes for this moisture or humidity phenomena. With this knowledge of what is causing the rain to occur and is causing these higher than desired relative humidity levels, these problems can be solved or prevented. Uh, Ashray Global uh, Training Center is also organizing uh, some programs you can see during uh, July to December 2020 and their topics are high performing healthcare facilities, introduction to UVGI systems, net zero energy buildings, effective energy management, refrigeration, cold chair, data center and many more. So you can register uh, by visiting the site and the site is given below you can see. There are some instructions for the participants. Participants, you can post your question in the question panels or using the question button in mobile. You can download the presentation from the handouts. Participants, this presentation is already available in the handouts. You can download it. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel of Ashi Rajasthan chapter. After the end of the webinar, please fill the webinar evaluation form. Okay, please fill the webinar evaluation form. Each certificate will be provided to all participants. So now I request Mr. Nunali 
to present on why it is raining in my surgery suit. So I am again uh, making you presenter. All right. Shalendra, thank you very much for the, are, are we up? Yeah, welcome. Uh, so now you are the presenter. Okay, can you see the screen okay? Uh, yes. Yeah, right. yeah, we can see your slides. Now, Mr. Nelly, go ahead. All right, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I was honored that you asked me to present to your chapter and congratulations to your chapter. Uh, Shalandra was telling me earlier today that you just we, we were just chartered in January of this year. So congratulations and I look forward to great and wonderful things from your chapter. It's been a blessing to be part of uh, ASHRAE for a number of years and uh, I've had a great time in our local chapter as well as the various regions. So I know that you will as well. Well, Shalandra had asked me to speak on uh, dehumidification, particularly desiccant dehumidifications, and we see that a great deal in the hospitals and particularly in the operating rooms. But um, this presentation is going to cover a number of uh, fundamentals regarding humidity control, not just in the operating room, but the rest of the hospital. And um, hopefully it will make sense to you as we talk about the psychrometrics of it, the really the principles of dehumidification, and hopefully they will help you in your, your various projects. I know from talking with Shalandra earlier that uh, the, the uh, number of attendees that we have, we've got a large number of consulting engineers, as well as those in academia, as well as those in the industry, and probably equipment sales, and a lot of other things. So. Um, Hopefully I can address a lot of your questions through the presentation, but if not, feel free to post a question and hopefully we will have time to answer that today. If not, um, you've got my email address there. Be, uh, be sure to email me and we will, uh, I'll try to answer you as best I can. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Shalandra, it's not advancing. Okay, let's see, Shalandra, there we go. Okay, um, this is just a, a slide, a, a lot about ASHRAE and Shalandra mentioned some of these just a few minutes ago, but I would encourage all of you, if you're not members of ASHRAE already, to get involved because ASHRAE is a volunteer organization. The handbooks that come out, the standards that are put together, they're all put together by folks just like you and me that are working out in the industry and we come together for a common purpose. So let me encourage you to get together and be a part of your chapter. Uh, so as we start the presentation, as I mentioned, really basically about humidity control in general and uh, an understanding of psychrometrics. And then we will apply that to the healthcare industry. So the question, that we often ask is who needs dehumidification and obviously um, there are a number of uh, people within the hospital that need dehumidification you see a picture here just the number of surgeons around the uh, around the surgery suite and as you notice they're gowned they are oftentimes double gowned and triple gowned wearing masks wearing hats wearing gloves and it's very it gets very uncomfortable in there. So oftentimes it's the surgeon that asks for the temperatures to be dropped lower and lower. And when you do that, you really need to have an understanding of the humidity level that's in the room. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's not just for the uh, doctor's comfort and the patient's comfort, but it is also for the, the health of the patient. Sometimes you've got to lower the body temperatures. Sometimes uh, you don't want to lower the body temperatures if it's small, you know, adolescents or pediatrics. So there are a number of things within the healthcare environment that we really need to understand the dynamics of the temperature and the humidity control. Uh, but put this slide together. 
it's why the concern over moisture? Why is it a big deal? Well, there are a number of reasons. I just mentioned the first bullet there, which was the comfort of the surgical staff and the patients. And you'll see ASHRAE as well as a lot of other organizations that are certainly here in the United States, but probably there in India as well. And they recommend certain temperatures and relative humidities. And we'll see a chart a little bit later on, but primarily they recommend that we keep the the humidity level, the relative humidity, lower than 60% at all times. Uh, we also see the productivity of the staff is, uh, is affected by the moisture content of the room, the humidity level there. Oftentimes, as you know, if it gets very humid, it's sticky, it's uncomfortable, and sometimes the staff will spend more time complaining to each other than being able to do the work that they're in there to do. So there's a productivity issue. And then we see health issues resulting from excessive humidity or even condensate that's in the room, particularly when condensate drips off of an unsterile device like a ceiling or a lamp or something like that. Obviously, if that's not being cleaned, you would have uh, some microbial growth that's in the condensate droplets that could drop down into the patient, uh, open wounds. Um, and then we just see surgical site infections that are also increasing as the humidity levels go up and and there are uh, mold growth or microbial growth throughout the room. So these are just a few of the concerns over moisture. But if you go to your fundamentals handbook of ASHRAE, and if you look through, why, look through all of the chapters and ask yourself, why do we design air conditioning systems for our buildings? And when I'm referring to air conditioning, that's not just cooling, not just heating, but it's total conditioning. It's heating, cooling, humidifying, dehumidifying, filtration, pressurization, that's all that goes into it. But oftentimes when you ask somebody, why do you air condition your buildings? The first answer they give you is to control the temperature. And then obviously if we dig a little deeper, we'll see in the ASHRAE Fundamentals Handbook, the, uh, the controlling of the humidity and the moisture. And then next is controlling the air movement and next is controlling the air quality. But the main thing that I want you to see throughout this is that they are saying control these particular aspects of the environment, not passively, not just what we say you get what you get, uh, but to actively monitor and then do something to control to that particular level that you're trying to achieve. And so I'm asked often, why is it so hard to control humidity in a building? Well, I don't think that it's really that hard, but I think the reasons that we see humidity control uh, as an issue in buildings is probably these three reasons. For all the projects that I've worked on for the last probably 25 years, it seems to boil down to one or all of these particular three reasons. The first, I see a great lack of understanding of psychrometrics. Next, I see that they are unaware of the ASHRAE published data, and we still refer to this in our industry as the new ASHRAE data. Well, new, that was first published in 1997. So it's really not new, 23 years that we have been, not we, but ASHRAE has been providing this particular data to the design community, but it's being ignored. And uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then the last, uh, bullet that you see here is installing inappropriate equipment uh, for the task that's at hand. And oftentimes, you know, I'm asked, hey, should I install a desk system? Should I install a mechanical system? What do I need to do? And hopefully we'll address that for you as well. Psychrometric chart. Uh, now this is my favorite tool right here. Now, I don't know, a lot of you won't get as excited about the psych chart. Uh, friends of mine call it a psychedelic chart. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but when you first look at the chart, it is an overwhelming chart. There are a lot of lines in here. They go different directions. Uh, so it does look confusing. And if you don't use this on a regular basis, I can understand that it may be overwhelming. But I want to spend a few minutes today going through the site chart in a very basic form so that hopefully you'll understand how we control humidity a little bit better. But if you ask the question, what is a psych chart? Here's the definition. It's basically just a study of the physical and thermodynamic properties of air and water vapor mixtures. 
So you might say everything about temperature and everything about humidity that you were afraid to ask, it's all right here on the site chart. I was uh, told by a senior engineer several years ago, he held up a copy of the site chart and he held up a copy of a ductilator. Maybe you've got some ductilators. And uh, he said, these are the two basic tools of the HVAC industry. You have got to understand how to use these two tools. And I think he was exactly right. And unfortunately, I see a lot of projects around the world that uh, I, we find out that uh, really didn't understand psychrometrics very much. So if we break it down into um, the simple terms here, the first that you see here is the dry bulb temperature. And if you look at the site chart, I've taken out all of the lines except for uh, the vertical lines, which indicate the dry bulb temperature. So you'll see a scale at the bottom from, this one is just abbreviated. So we're going from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, if you go back to the site chart, it's, you know, it, it's a lot larger as far as the scale on the bottom, but we just sort of took the heart out of the middle of it to make it easier for the presentation. But if I were to take a thermometer like you see at the bottom of the page, uh, that's just what we refer to as a dry bulb thermometer. There's no wet sock or wick on the bottom of it. This is just a typical thermometer. But as the temperature rises or moves from the left to the right on this thermometer, you will see it moving from the left to the right on the site chart as well. So for example, if we read 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit or approximately 24 degrees centigrade, then you would go to the scale at the bottom of the site chart, find your 75 degrees and draw a vertical line right there. That's all we know at this particular time about the environmental conditions of this room where we're measuring 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It is somewhere along the vertical line. We don't really know where to place that red dot yet or the state point. All we know is, is the vertical line. So the next item that we might look at is the wet bulb temperature. To the right of the site chart, you'll see a sling psychrometer. Many of you maybe used that in the past, but there are two thermometers that are identical the only difference would be on the right-hand side, you'll see a wick or a sock tied to that. And that is connected on the other end to a reservoir of distilled water. So what's happening as you are slinging the psychrometer around, circulating it in your hand, um, the wet bulb begins to drop because there is a difference in the dry bulb and the wet bulb in the atmosphere in which it's swinging. So as moisture is evaporating off of the wick or that wet sock of the wet bulb, it's drawing some heat. You have to have heat to have a phase change from a liquid to a vapor. So it's drawing the heat out of that thermometer. And so the drier it is outside, the greater the differential will be between the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperatures. So let's say we've slung this around and uh, we see there's a difference of 75 degrees dry bulb and 62.5 wet bulb. And then you would chart this out. You would go to the curve that's on the top left of the site chart and you would find 62.5 uh, Fahrenheit wet bulb. And then you would follow that diagonal line. And where that line intersects the 75 degrees that we had right here earlier, that is now your state point. That will tell you all of the other conditions that you want to know about the environment in which you are uh, trying to work. The next piece of the site chart that you will see will be the relative humidity curve. And Again, if we have already established this is 75 degree dry bulb and we've looked at the 62.5 Fahrenheit wet bulb and the state point, the curve that it intersects, you can follow the curve and you will read the, um, the relative humidity value on that particular curve. So this would tell you at 75 degrees dry bulb, and 62.5 wet bulb, you are at a relative humidity of 50%. Now, what that means is relative to that particular temperature, 
the mount the the environment let's say you would take a cubic foot of air it is holding 50 percent of the moisture that it could hold until it was completely saturated so this distance here is the same as this distance here uh, but if you change the temperature and you don't remove moisture then you would increase or decrease the relative humidity so we always need to understand that when we refer to a relative humidity term we have to also account for what dry bulb temperature that relative humidity was read. I would rather us get away from using relative humidity altogether and go to a more absolute term, but we still use abs uh, relative humidity for a number of reasons. Uh, there are a number of charts and tables and guidelines in our industry that we use that are all based on relative humidity. This is a chart of, of research that was done probably 20 years ago now, or maybe a little bit longer. Uh, and this will show you the adverse health effects in an office building. So this is roughly 72 to 75 degree dry bulb where we studied. But this tells you the adverse effect of bacteria, viruses, fungi, mites, respiratory infections, and, and a lot of other things. But obviously, if we did not want to have mold growth, biological growth in our space, which is under the fungi, then we could get the relative humidity as low as possible and we would not have an issue with mold because we see that it generally it doesn't start until maybe above 60% and certainly above 70% and it begins to climb. But the problem with keeping the air too dry in our environment is that we increase the adverse health effects of a lot of other things, ozone production, allergies, viruses, bacteria, things like that. So there's an optimum zone that you can minimize the adverse effects of all of these things that you see on the left if we maintain somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. I've also seen tables that show 30 to 60 percent, but uh, ideally, this is the range that you would want to keep. Another table that you might be familiar with is the ASHRAE Human Comfort Zone. And this chart that you see right here out of our Fundamentals Handbook is really the heart out of the middle of the site chart. And you'll see uh, summer conditions and winter conditions. Uh, there is an optimum uh, comfort zone for the people that are in our office buildings and our classrooms and it shows that if we maintain the space between these particular temperatures and these particular relative humidity terms or even dew point then most of the people and I believe the study referred to 90 percent of the people will not be so um, uncomfortable that they would be willing to leave the building or not pay rent go somewhere else so that's another reason that we use relative humidity. But as I mentioned, I prefer that we talk about absolute humidity or the humidity ratio. If you look at the site chart, now that we have established where the state point is for our particular room, we know that this is 75 degree dry bulb and 62.5 degree wet bulb Fahrenheit. Uh, then we can draw that horizontal line through that state point and if we first think of humidity ratio, that is in terms of grains of moisture per pound of dry air, or we might think of that as pounds of moisture per pound of dry air. And we would just uh, multiply the, if it were pounds per pound, then we multiply that by 7,000 to come up with grains. Grains is just a unit of measurement that we use so that we don't have to deal with all of the small decimals, 0.007, pounds of moisture per pound of dry air or something like that. But again, this is an absolute moisture level. Another term that we might use for our absolute moisture level would be dew point temperature. And again, this is the same horizontal line. So you could either follow the line to the left and where it reaches this particular curve, which is 100% relative humidity or the saturation curve, we would also see the number of uh, the dew point. It could be, in this case, it's 55 degree dew point. You'll notice when we're referring to dew point, if you are at the 100% relative humidity or saturation curve, then the dry bulb temperature, the wet bulb temperature, and the dew point are all the same. 
many chart, uh, many of the site charts, you can also follow that line all the way to the right, and there would be a scale over here that would also indicate the drive uh, the um, the dew point temperature. So uh, you can find that either way. But what is the dew point? The dew point temperature is the temperature in which the moisture level in that air is such that it will begin to condense, go from a vapor to a liquid when it touches something of that particular temperature. Now you'll see a, a glass of ice water here, which is, you. this is very common for you, I'm sure, to see all the condensate dripping on the outside. And that is because the moisture level, the dew point of the air that is surrounding this cold surface this dew point is higher than that uh, dry bulb temperature of the surface, so it begins to condense. We see this on our windows often as well, when the dew point temperature outside of the building is, um, is much higher than the surface temperature of those glass, uh, of the glass windows. But that's the uh, absolute moisture level, either relative, uh, I'm sorry, humidity ratio or dew point. And that's why we need to understand the dew point, because if we know how cold any of the surfaces may be in our operating rooms or throughout the hospital, we know that we need to keep the dew point temperature of the air in that environment lower than the, the surface temperature. And I usually like to keep that, uh, strive to keep the temperature, the dry bulb, I'm sorry, I strive to keep the dew point temperature in that environment at least five degrees lower than any surface temperature that I might encounter. Here's an example of an operating room that had some humidity problems. They were dropping the temperature down as probably 60 degree dry bulb temperature, which is where the doctors wanted it. But the problem is they hadn't removed enough moisture from the space and then while all the surfaces were 60 degrees dry bulb the humidity level in here was greater than 60 degree dew point so you would have a lot of condensate building up on these surfaces and it would drip so they ended up suspending plastic bags around everything that was dripping and you'll see in this little corner of the bag blown up item here but you see the condensates dripping and falling into this bag they were having to do that to keep that, those condensate droplets from dropping down on the patients while they were in the middle of surgery. And that's not a good thing. I have a simple mind, so let me explain to you my balloons here, and hopefully this will help you understand the psychometric chart a little bit more. Let's say, for example, this metal balloon, if I were to blow that balloon up to a volume of, of one cubic foot, and I fill that with, turns out to be equivalent to about 3.75 gallons of water in that balloon, if it were 50% full of water. Now, if I were to take that balloon and I put that in a very warm environment, let's say I stuck that in an oven, but not enough to pop the balloon, my balloon might look like this. So I could ask you, how much water do you see in that balloon? And some of you might think in relative terms and you might say, oh, it looks like it's about 25% full or 30% full of water. And that will be correct. But if I said absolutely how much water do I have in there? If you were to measure the gallons of water, how many gallons do I have? And the answer would be 3.75 because I've not let any water out and I've not added any water. All I have done was increase the temperature of the air that is holding that balloon. By the same token, if I took that balloon and I put it in a refrigerator and made it colder, it would end up looking like this. So again, the same thing. If I ask you, how much water am I holding in that balloon? You might tell me 95%, and that would be correct as a relative term. But the absolute term, if you were to measure the water, again, would be 3.75 gallons. So hopefully that little schematic will help you understand the differences between relative humidity and absolute humidity. So when you go to the site chart and you measure the dew point temperature, we're back up a slide or two. 
See, if I'm at the same moisture level, if I'm here at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'll reduce that to 55 degrees Fahrenheit and I did not remove any moisture from the air, I'm still at 55 degree dew point. What's my relative humidity here? It would be 100%, uh, you know, 80% here, 70%, et cetera. So uh, hopefully that helps you understand the differences between uh, absolute and relative humidity. Uh, I also, another simple chart here, I think of this site chart as a bucket of water. And I've overlaid a bucket or a pail here to help you understand that. There are two things that I'm concerned about with the site chart. Now, there are a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of information on it and it's very useful, but the two things that I think of primarily are the dry bulb temperature and the dew point temperature. I want to know how much heat do I have in, the, in that particular air and how much moisture do I have. So if I'm adding a flame or adding some heat into the facility, think of the thermometer going from left to right. So on the site chart, I would go from left to right as I'm increasing temperature. As I'm adding moisture, I go from the very bottom, which is zero moisture or zero grains of moisture, zero dew point. And as I add moisture into my pail, I add moisture into my airstream and I would increase on the site chart going from the bottom up to the top. So those are the two critical things to understand about the site chart. Uh, the last thing that I'll talk about in the site chart would be the enthalpy or enthalpy. Uh, different people pronounce it different ways, but that's the amount of energy that you have stored up in the airstream. That air may be from the flame that you saw in the previous slide. It could be some type of heat source. It could be the heat coming off of off of the computers, it could be the heat coming from the lights, it could be the heat coming through the windows from the solar gain, it could be some sensible heat coming off of your body, but all of this heat that comes into your space, that increases the temperature from the left to the right, and that adds energy. So you can imagine right here, if you were at this particular level, um, well, let's say you're on this level here, you might be at 25, BTUs per pound, and as you increase the dry bulb temperature, you're moving from left to right, and now you'll see that you go up to this chart, and you'll see you're at 28.1. These lines on parts of the site chart overlap the, uh, the wet bulb temperature lines, but they are not parallel throughout the whole chart, so you need to be careful when you're following the enthalpy line. But that's the amount of energy. As you add moisture, let's say you started here at 75 degrees with no moisture, you'll see you're at about 17 uh, BTUs per pound. But as you add moisture, then you are also adding BTUs. So when we look at this BTU number, that's total BTUs derived from the sensible load or the heat gain, as well as the moisture load or the latent gain. These are three formulas that we use. So again, if you, if you understand the site chart, you understand how to use a ductilator, and you know these three formulas right here, uh, you can attack any HVAC issue out there. I'm confident of that. So if you wanna look at the total load, this is the BTUs per hour times the uh, factor right here, constant, and the difference in enthalpy times the cubic feet per minute running through that particular air handler. And that would give you the total uh, load of that particular building or, or let's say maybe what that particular air handler is capable of handling and that gives you a combination of sensible and latent. If you wanted to break that down between sensible and latent here are the formulas for that and rather than spend a lot of time we're going to do an example in just a minute with this last formula right here for the latent load and hopefully it will make sense to you. Um, I think one final thing I'd like to show you on the uh, site chart is the vapor pressure. I, this very much like the humidity ratio and the dew point is that same horizontal line. And on most site charts, you can go over, usually it's on the far right, and you'll see what the vapor pressure is of that air. In this case, it turns out to be 4.38 inches of mercury. And the reason I say that, that's the, the weight of the moisture that's in the air that uh, is the force that drives that moisture into a drier environment. Moisture seeks equilibrium. So if you've got an extremely humid day outside 
and you have done all that you can to dry your building out and you run your dehumidification system, your air conditioning system, and you got it nice and comfortable, but you have infiltration from outside. So the moisture that is outside, um, let's say this is where you are outside, 0.438 inches of mercury, but inside you happen to be somewhere along here, which is going to be a much lower um, vapor pressure, that weight of moisture will push moisture into your building. So we need to understand that that's the driving factor of pushing moisture from one area to another. And just a quick example, uh, if we were to take a particular environment, uh, as we've been looking at the site chart of 75 degrees dry bulb and 50%, that's the, four, uh, the 0 0.438 I just showed you on the chart. And let's say um, outside the building, you had a, a fairly mild day, certainly mild for what I've seen. Uh, on, I'm looking at the site chart and the numbers for uh, where you are at uh, Rajasthan. But let's say outside it was 82 dry bulb and 77 degree wet bulb. That's a, that's a vapor pressure of 0.883 inches of mercury. So you see the difference right there of 0.445 inches of mercury, or if you think in terms like I do, in the air conditioning world, we usually think of inches of water column or inches of water gauge. You multiply that by this particular factor and you come up with six inches of water column. Those of you in the HVAC world that do duct design know that's an extremely high number. So that just gives you an idea of how much force there is trying to push that moisture into your building. Uh, here's a graphical example of that. We just see all the pressure from outside with the very humid air pushing to a drier environment. Think of your building as a dried out sponge. And when it sits, when that sponge sits on a table that's got water, it will absorb the water, just like this building will absorb moisture from outside. Now, the better we isolate this, the, the, the better the integrity of the building envelope, the slower that moisture will come in but we don't have perfect buildings. We can't completely seal the building. We will have infiltration. So we just need to understand what happens when we have a difference in vapor pressure. All right, now that you are all experts on psychrometrics, um, let me explain to you why the new, I call, I call new tables also, why the tables that were presented in 19, 87 came about and how we're supposed to use those. This is a typical day we had one summer in Birmingham. I was I was measuring outside and this is your dry bulb that happened that particular day. And it started off fairly cool in the mornings. Uh, this, this is midnight, noon and midnight over here. So we see that it was about 76 or 77 degrees uh, throughout the you know, the early morning, then the sun comes up, the buildings start to warm up, the ground starts to warm up because the sun is out, and we see the temperature starting to do this. And then about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, well, actually, uh, this was about 1.30, um, then we start seeing it cool down a little bit. And this might be a typical day for you on a, you know, it's not a rainy or stormy day, but just a cycle. On this particular day, this was the moisture level we were reading. This was the grains of moisture per pound of dry air, the absolute moisture. And we see it was somewhat steady during the night and then it began increasing during the mornings. This was eight o'clock in the morning and then again at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. And then for some reason it dropped down. Uh, maybe there was a wind, you know, a cold front coming in or at least a cool front or a dry front with the winds blowing. But uh, we see a cycle like this. I'm not telling you that every day looks like this, but I want to point out that the dry bulb peak and the moisture peak are not necessarily coincident peaks. You might very well have an extremely humid morning and then it tapers off in the afternoon. So the problem is if we design all of our air conditioning systems for our building, whether it be a hospital or a school or an office building, and we design it for that two to three o'clock in the afternoon condition, then we may very well have missed the peak moisture level over here. Think of this as a school. If uh, 
if you open up all the dampers to bring in all of your ventilation air in the mornings because your students and your teachers are starting to come in, you may have opened up dampers at seven o'clock in the morning and it was fairly mild outside temperature wise, your sensible load, but your moisture level was very high. And if all you had on the walls of your classrooms was a thermostat, it's not reading very much of an increase in temperature, but yet you have packed your building full of moisture and you might have a humidity problem in that building. So it's this particular information that came up, that um, encouraged ASHRAE to look at the tables. Now, I don't expect you to see all these numbers. I'm going to uh, increase and show you just this particular piece at the top. But you'll see thousands of cities throughout the world that have weather data that has been collected for as long as weather data has been collected for that particular city. But for your particular environment right here, this was the closest weather station and this tells you the latitude longitude and all the other fun things but what i want to show you is this actual cooling dehumidification and enthalpy design data all of this data here and i'm going to just blow that piece up and you'll see these uh, two lines right here what we had in the past prior to uh, 1997 i think i said 87 earlier but it's 97 all we had was the cooling dry bulb with the mean coincident wet bulb. And then you had three options. If it was an extremely critical building like a laboratory environment, we might choose to use the 0.4% occurrence. And that would mean 99.6% of the year if I used this weather data based on historical numbers from that particular city, I should be fine as far as the way I designed my air conditioning load. Uh, this case is 1%, which might be something that's less critical. Maybe it's office buildings, classrooms, or something like that. And again, this 1% means if I design for this condition right here, 99% of the year, I should have enough air conditioning or cooling capacity to take care of my building. And then you'll see in just a minute when we put this on the site chart, how much, you know, you, we know two things like we saw earlier. We know the dry bulb and the wet bulb, and we can determine all the other factors. And then what's, what we became aware of, we need to start looking at that peak at other times of the day, which might be the peak dehumidification as the dew point with the mean coincident dry bulb and the humidity ratio. And you'll see these particular numbers right here. So those numbers may not mean an awful lot to you looking at it that way, but if we maybe put it on a chart to pull up your site chart maybe you've got this electronically and you plug in the two numbers from the cooling uh, design point and it will tell you all of the other numbers that correspond with that on the site chart same thing over here for the dehumidification you plug in the numbers that are known and then the rest of the numbers you can determine from your site chart or if you look at it from the site chart here's what you see that cooling design day that i just showed you on the chart that would be this number right here. If you remember the site chart looking like a pail of water, that's not a very high level of moisture. But when you look at that peak dew point or the peak dew humidification day, that's where that point is. Look at how much more moisture level you would have uh, at that. Now, I had one engineer tell me on a project several years ago, he said, well, I'm not too worried about that particular point. That doesn't happen all that often. Well, I pointed out that no, it happens the same percentage of time that that one does. It's the cooling, the cooling point and the dehumidification point are both 1% numbers. That means there's 1% uh, of the time that you're going to be above this particular number. So the number of hours are the same. So the, I don't understand why we spend so much time just on the temperature of the building and we don't pay attention to the, the uh, moisture levels in the building. So here it is graphically on the chart to see what a difference it is. Well, let's look at some numbers. Let's say if we wanted to design this space to be a patient room or an office building with you know the doctor's offices or your classroom, and let's say we want a 75 degree dry bulb and 50% relative humidity, here are all the other points on the site chart. That's this point right here. So if we design for the cooling day only from this point to that point, we would we can calculate through the enthalpy over here 
how much tonnage, how much cooling we need to get from here to here. And then we can do the same with the peak dehumidification day going from this point to this point. You'll see there's a big difference in the enthalpy there. So the next chart's gonna point that out. Let's say, for example, if I were to precondition the outside air, and in this example, I'm going to require one, uh, I'm sorry, 10,000 cubic feet per minute of outside air to come into my building for ventilation. So I wanna know how much dehumidification capacity or a refrigeration capacity do I need to get from this point to that point just for the dehumidification and cooling of the outside air. You'll see I need 78.8 .8 tons of cooling. Now, if I wanted to go from this point to that point, I would only need 40.5 tons of refrigeration capacity to go from that point to that point. And also you'll see if I'm going from that peak dehumidification day, I would need to remove 577.9 pounds of moisture per hour to go from there to there. If I had only designed for that peak dry bulb day, I need to actually add moisture from that case up to here in order to meet my load or my condition of 7550. So that's a huge difference and that's in a patient room. What if we go to an operating room and the doctor or the surgeon says it is too warm in here at 65 degrees or 68 degrees. I want 60 degrees in here. So you drop down to 60 degrees and you run through the same calculations that I just did. Just for 10,000 CFM of outside air, uh, the ventilation air to go from this point to this point required 106 tons of cooling or refrigeration capacity uh, to go from the peak dry bulb day you would see that I, I need to also well, I'm sorry that's right here that I would need to remove moisture but only 103.5 pounds of moisture per hour so that's a huge difference look at the amount of moisture removal so if I had only designed the what I would call the air conditioning system for that peak dry bulb day I cannot dehumidify that much air, and then we wonder why we have moisture in our buildings. I'm a big proponent of divide and conquer when I'm using dedicated outdoor air systems. I know just like from the two charts I just showed you, when we bring in outside air, we bring in a lot of moisture in many climates. We do here in the southeastern part of the United States, and you certainly do there in your part of India. So, if I know that my loads inside of my building, my moisture load as well as my sensible load for my dry bulb load, uh, that stays pretty much the same. We have the same number of lights on, we have the same number of computers, we have the same uh, copy, number of copy machines. So that's pretty constant throughout the day. The varying factor is what's coming in from outside. So if I can negate the effect of the ups and downs of the humidity and the ups and downs of the temperature, in some type of dedicated outdoor air unit and then deliver that air into my space at somewhat of a space neutral temperature, then I can just let all of my fan coil units or whatever else I might have conditioning my space, those can be just driven off of a thermostat in each one of those rooms. But I've got to have a humidistat somewhere driving the operations of the dedicated outdoor air system. So I'm a big proponent of that. But you ask me, well, how dry do I need to make the air coming out of this dedicated outdoor air system? Well, you go back to the formula that I was showing you earlier for the latent gain, and that's equal to, at least in um, um, the SI units, the uh, 0.68 times the delta or the difference in grains times the cubic feet of air going through this particular unit. So if I know that the space condition that I want to maintain here level you know, for the moisture is along this particular dew point, then you know, let's say in this case it's 50 degree, I'm sorry, this is humidity ratio, then I know that I've got to deliver the air a little bit drier than that to start with so that it can pick up the latent gain that I'm going to find in the space due to the people and the coffee pot and fountain that may be in the lobby, anything else that may be the latent gain. So this is the formula I showed you earlier. Uh, w is the humidity ratio. So uh, I've already spoken to that. So the, I know 
I'm back up here. I know everything in here except for what the humidity ratio is of the supply air that I need to deliver into the space. So we're serving us, uh, calculating for that particular value, then this is, you know, this is what the formula would look like. And so given this example, the administrative office building of 73 dry bulb and 50%, and let's assume, and we can find these types of numbers in the ASHRAE Fundamentals Handbook, if I'm going to have a latent gain per person of about 200 BTUs per hour, and let's say I've gone through my ASHRAE standard 62.1, and I've determined I need an equivalent of 20 cubic feet per minute per person, then I can find on my site chart these numbers, and I calculate it, and it tells me that I need to be delivering that air at 65.9 dew point, or 45, almost 46 grains of moisture per pound of dry air, in order to maintain the space requirements that I had sought out to do. We change that, we've got an operating room now, the calculations are the same. We start off at a different point uh, for the site, uh, and the we need to be delivering air at 28.7 grains of moisture per pound of dry air or 33.9 dew point. So that's a significant difference when you drop down uh, from a, a patient room to an operating room. This is a table that you'll see out of the healthcare design book from ASHRAE and you look over here at the um, design relative humidity numbers and here you have the design temperatures and you'll see these numbers right here, you look for operating rooms over here, and it shows 20 to 60 percent. Uh, I think there are efforts underway to raise that number a little bit, but 60 percent, and then you'll see temperatures over here. Uh, but there's a, a note in this table, too, that tells you that that temperature may not satisfy what the doctors need. I just back that may not satisfy what the doctors are wanting in that particular operating room. So it may be lower or it may be higher. And this is a similar table, but it compares ASHRAE with AIA guidelines and, and several others. But again, you see the 30 to 60% here and 68 to 75 degrees. Here are the uh, notes and the uh, more current book. There's nothing in these guidelines shall be construed as precluding the use of temperatures lower than those noted when the patient's comfort and medical conditions make the lower temperatures desirable. So I see too often that whoever's designing the operating rooms are sticking with these numbers and only those numbers and not paying attention to the fact that that's not really what the doctors want in that particular operating room, particularly the orthopedics and the cardiovascular surgeries. So this is just a, a, a graphic a graphical illustration of that. Let's say you design for that 68 to 75 degree window and 30 to 60 percent, and you even designed on the low end of that. So maybe that's your that is your point right there that you designed for. But now your surgeon comes in and tells his or her staff to drop the temperature as low as possible, and they drop it down to 60 degrees rather than 68. Now you'll see right here that the relative humidity is actually 66%, uh, you see 60 here, 70 here. So in that case, it's 60. And if you drop the temperature even lower, I see some operating rooms actually going down to 55 degrees and you'll see you're at about 80% relative humidity there. That's a problem. So uh, in the next few minutes and we'll wind up with these. There are two ways and only two ways to get moisture out of the airstream. You absorb it out or adsorb it, depending on the type of desiccant that you use, liquid or solid, or you condense the moisture out. And most people are very familiar with the condensing it out, but not as familiar with the adsorbing or absorbing it out. So here are the two technologies, the desiccant-based system, which again is solid, and we usually see that, and at least in the HVAC world, on, in the form of a wheel or liquid desiccants, and you'll see this, this um, going through generators and regenerators, uh, but uh, we're just going to talk about this today because that's what we see mostly in the commercial markets. Uh, then you see the mechanical systems. It may be chilled water-based, it may be direct expansion-based uh, refrigerant. Uh, but on, this, on the um, desiccant, 
it would be an air hammer with a wheel in it. And this wheel moves very slowly. Oftentimes it's about 16 to 18 revolutions per hour. And what happens here, this is the air that we're trying to dry out. It could be outside air, it could be air from the space or a combination of the two, but we call it process air. This is the air that's to dry out. It goes through this wheel that has been laden or impregnated with a desiccant product, oftentimes silica gel. And moisture is drawn off of this into the desiccant because the desiccant has a much lower vapor pressure. And then it comes out the other side, a much drier air. It is warmer, but it's drier. Warmer because we pick up a lot of latent heat of uh, uh, fusion right there. Uh, plus we pick up a little bit of heat from the fuel that we use for the reactivation of that wheel. Uh, this is what it would look like in the site chart. If you're starting at this point in your process, you go through the wheel, you are actually going from left to right, you're warming it up, but you are also going from up here to down here, so you're drying it out. And then at this point, you'll need to do some type of post cooling or cooling after the wheel, and that's where we get the sensible cooling right here. You may, well, I'm sure you're all familiar with these little packages. This is a silica gel, this is a desiccant. This is the type of product that is bonded into that wheel. They aren't the little beads that we see in these, but they are coated uh, you know, in a liquid form to start with and coated on. Uh, you're all familiar with the, the cooling coil or the dehumidification process using a cold coil. The air comes through, again, the same process air. It touches something that's cooler than its dew point. And then at that point, the moisture is wrung out or, or condensed out. And then oftentimes we need to add some type of heat uh, downstream of that, or we are going to overcool our space. This is what that process looks like on the site chart. We're moving from here to that same red state point from the previous slide, but it goes in an opposite direction. We go from here and we'll begin cooling it down all the way to saturation, where the apparatus dew point is of the coils. And then from that point, we might need to do some reheat in order to get it to this point right here. A lot of different types of mechanical systems and parts and pieces that you can add to them to make them more effective for humidity control. This is what I would refer to as a hybrid system. And this is what I've used on most all of the surgical suites that I have uh, worked with. In this case, we're using the best of both worlds. Let's do what the mechanical system does very effectively and very efficiently, and let's reduce the moisture out down to a particular dew point of the coils. So in this case, this particular unit right here has pre-cooling coils, pre because that means before, and that's before the wheel, that's the desiccant wheel. So let's let this air come in, again, outside air or return air, and that comes in and will dehumidified down to the coil dew point temperature. And let's say that's 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's very easily done with coils. Now we can take it from that point and go through the wheel and do the deep drying. And, you know, I could do it all with the wheel, but it would be a much larger wheel. It would require much more energy, but uh, this is a much more efficient way of doing it. So let's pre-cool with the, or, you know, really we're pre-dehumidifying, but let's get moisture out there, then let's get moisture out here, and then we'll heat or cool as necessary downstream to send that drier air into the space. People ask me oftentimes, uh, Mark, when, when should I use a mechanical system? When should I use a desiccant system? And just my particular rule of thumb would be if I'm trying to achieve above a 50 degree dew point, I can very easily do that with a mechanical system, and I would tend to use the mechanical systems above that. If I knew that we needed to absolutely maintain 45 degree dew point and lower, then I would likely go with the desiccant based product for that. And then there's an area in between. I call this the gray zone. Uh, I might go either way. It depends on how critical it is. If I ask the client, how, how important is it that you maintain you told me you wanted 45 degrees. What happens if you go to 48 degree dew point? Oh, that's not a big deal. We're not worried about that. Okay, then I probably wouldn't spend the additional money, cost, you know, the capital cost as well as the operating cost 
of putting a desiccant-based system if it's not that critical. But if it is, then I would lean toward the desiccant. So that's just my rule of thumb. And then the last two to three minutes, we're gonna just show you very briefly some hospital applications. Uh, this was up on the rooftop of a unit. This is just a chase where the outside air would come in. You'll see on the next schematic. But uh, this air would be drawn into some louvers that are on the side of the building. The whole purpose of this wall was just to keep all the diesel fumes from the delivery trucks out of the intakes. So in this case, one of those louvers fed the surgery suite and we added a desiccant dehumidification system on the roof. We used pre-cooling coils, desiccant and post heating and post cooling coils. And this is duct that goes into the side of this. And you'll see it right here. This duct goes in, then it goes down here, then there are louvers on the wall. Uh, this is that same duct work. This is what it looked like schematically. This is the unit that served the surgery. So we just brought outside air in through the duct, connected it right here, and then that now served the uh, operating rooms. From this point forward, we were able to dry this out enough, much cooler and much a lower dew point air than even the cooling coils here. So we had dry coils from this point forward. That was great as far as uh, not having any type of buildup on the cooling coils and much easier to maintain. Uh, this is the way we calculated and sized that up. We did pre-cooling all the way down to 50 degree dew point, And then we ran that through the desiccant rotor. And then we did some post-cooling to this particular condition right here. And then let the air handler mix this air with the return air to get to this point right here. Here's another hospital. We really did it the same way. That's a unit that's up on the roof that fed another air handler that served the, the surgical suite after it, after it mixed this air with the return air. There's another hospital. This is the air handling unit that served uh, through this duct work. It served the cardiovascular suite, and this was the outside air intake. So we removed that, what we call a gooseneck hood, and we then added this duct up to the roof and put the desiccant unit up there, and we were able to dry that air out mix that with the return air, and then that goes through the ductwork and to the operating room. Just, uh, I know I've only got one slide left, we're about done. The, you'll see these and you've all got handouts, so I'm not going to go through all this, but the greatest thing about the desiccants, you can really get down to the low dew points. So you can get down as far as you wanna go, just depend on how you size that desiccant. Uh, the disadvantages, uh, of a typical desiccant unit, it would be more expensive than your common uh, mechanical system. And most contractors that we've worked with really have a fear of them just because they don't understand them and they don't know how to work on them. So there may be some training involved for the contractor as well as the client, but I think those are easy to overcome. So. There we are. I'm sorry I'm two minutes late. I know I went 100 miles an hour with gust up to 120. Uh, but hopefully the information that was shared in the in this particular webinar was beneficial to you. And Shalandra, if, if they if you've got time and they have questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to address some of those. If not, uh, send me the emails and I can answer those that way. But I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mark for amazing presentation. Uh, we can take some of the questions of the participants. Yes. Uh, yes, this is a question from Ankit Kumar. Tal. How much continuous layer of water or moisture affects heat transfer at surface of cooling coil and insulation of duct with overall reduction in COP. Okay, um, let me try to address some of those and if I don't get all the questions, come back to me. Uh, how much does moisture affect the heat transfer capability of a cooling coil? Tremendously. If you sell equipment, for example, or if you have software that shows you know, cooling coil capacity, if you were to show that the, the entering air condition to be much drier, the dew point that's 
either at or not too high above the apparatus dew point of those coils, you'll see that it that it can very easily take care of this sensible load. If you put a lot of moisture in the air and you're bringing in you know, humid air, mixing that with return air or coming straight into the cooling coil, it takes an awful lot of coil capacity to wring that latent load out of that airstream before you can even get to the sensible load uh, so it's a it's a huge difference on the hospital the first hospital application that I showed you uh, as I mentioned we were able to deliver that air I think their cooling coil coil was normally uh, running with 42 degree Fahrenheit uh, inlet water and delivering uh, I had a 10 to 12 degree delta T to the coils but they had to keep the coils at the lowest they could which was 42 degrees just to get the moisture out of that airstream. Once we put the dehumidifier there and we were delivering air at I believe 38 degree dew point, those coils were cold. There was, I mean, dry. There was no condensation on the coils. They didn't have to clean the coils like they used to years past. These were eight row coils in that particular air handler. And if you've ever done any coil cleaning, that's extremely difficult to be able to penetrate eight rows of coils to get the uh, the mold, or not mold, but the, uh, the algae buildup off of those coils. And they were delighted to have shiny coils from that point. Uh, then you also asked a question regarding, I believe the COP of the equipment, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this, one of the things that I have seen that uh, I think is a real problem in our industry is we are so eager to make our equipment more and more efficient. You know, it was not uncommon that just a few years ago, the typical uh, sensible heat ratio of a cooling coil or an air handler total might be about 0.6 or 0.65. What that meant was that uh, 30, well, yeah, 35 to 40 percent of the coil's capacity was dedicated to do dehumidification, and the remaining component was for the sensible load. But now that we want to be much more efficient, then we oftentimes see, and this is particularly packaged air handlers, uh, rooftop unit, for example, it might very well be 0.9 sensible heat ratio. What does that mean? That means that 90% of that coil is dedicated to the sensible load and only 10% to the latent load. So most of the time when I see buildings that have, oh, we put in new equipment, this is more efficient, but I'm having problems. We had a 15 ton rooftop unit and we have a new 15 ton rooftop unit, but I'm having moisture problems within my building. So I had to add a dehumidifier. Uh, so, I mean, that's a common problem that I see quite often. So, yes, you have saved some energy dollars because you have a more efficient piece of equipment, but hopefully you've saved enough in your energy to buy yourself a nice dehumidification unit. Um, you had also asked about insulation, and I need you to repeat that particular part of the question, if you would, please. Or scared yes, you walk. <laughs> Next question is from Mazin Mohammed Noor. Uh, I would like to unmute Mazin. Mazin, can you uh, unmute yourself? Mazin Mohammed Noor. Okay, so his question is. Uh, what are the criteria for removing moisture from Gorkoi rooms? From what type of room? I'm sorry. Uh, Gorkoi, G-A-R-C-O-Y, Gorkoi rooms. I haven't heard uh, such type of rooms. I'm, I'm not familiar with that type of room either. We may have that room, but we call it something different in the States. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mazin, you can uh, uh, un you can unmute yourself and uh, you can ask the question. 
ओके तो नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन what is your mind let me just kind of in general although i'm not familiar with what that type of room is but any type of room whether it be a surgery suite a clean room a lab an office room what are the criteria the two things that you need to ask your client uh when you are starting to design your building what are the conditions what's first of all what's the condition of the space that you need to maintain and you plot that out on your site chart and you can see the absolute moisture level and dew point or humidity ratio that you need to maintain in that space and the so that's the first point and then obviously you'd want to know is this critical all the time or just when it's occupied or what about when it's unoccupied so ask all of those types of questions then the next thing that you would do is go to your uh design document design criteria for the particular city in which you are designing and as i showed you in this particular site chart uh for uh you know this area of uh this one like here <laughs> on the uh rajasthan you i showed you what the peak dew point day was and what the peak dry bulb day is. so that's where you would start for your ventilation load Uh, I look at the site chart like I do a road map. Back when we used to actually have paper road maps and we didn't use our cell phones all the time, but I would look at the chart and point out the city that I needed to go. This was my final destination, and then I look at the map. Now here's where I'm starting. Here's where I'm ending up. What is the best route to get there? That's what the site chart does. It helps you plot where you're starting with your outside air. and maybe your outside air mixing with your return air so you plot that out to get your design or your mixed condition so that's where you start and then you plot the point that you're trying to get to on the site chart and you draw that line and figure out the best way to get there the problem that i see with so many of the designers is that we are so uh, reliant on software we plug in the design day and it spits out and then we look at the numbers and it tells us i need this particular amount of latent load and this sensible load i can do this with x number of tons and then you never really even plot that out on the site chart to see if it's really going to work so i would encourage all of you designers to always plot out the process on a site chart to make certain that what you're designing is really going to work So I hope that answered the uh, the Gartco question. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, next question: uh, By using wheel, don't you think there will be contamination transfer from recovery air to supply air? Why cannot we use the plate type heat exchanger? Okay, if you have a plate type heat exchanger or even a wheel type heat exchanger. where you have a contaminated air source coming from the building because of some type of exhaust or relief air if there is a concern maybe tuberculosis or covid or whatever the contaminant is if there is a concern that that would be brought back into the building yes do not use any type of uh a wheel or plate heat exchanger that has the air paths across now often times a plate heat exchanger the plates are separating the incoming air you know the ventilation air and the exhaust air or relief air so you might be okay with that but yes you never want to mix the air stream so you would certainly make sure that whatever technology you are using is not going to let the two air streams touch okay uh, next question is uh, with pre cooling sensitive uh, with pre cooling sensible cooling system air can reach up to 100% relative humidity resident moisture absorption in which basis will be efficient dew point rh or absolute humidity You, I'm not sure about the part that you said 200. You, are you the 200 percent? That wasn't relative humidity. Obviously, that was what you're increasing the amount of dehumidification by 200 percent. Is that what 
Is that what you're saying? Salandra, I want to make sure I understand the question for the that two hundred percent. So uh, I'm going to do the last question. Okay. Well, I'm not sure I answered the last one, but let, if, if it's okay, let me a, a real quick answer. Um, depending on the, let's say it's a chill water system. Depending on what your chill water system temperature is. You know, if you are having to drive your chiller down to a very cold temperature just to do the dehumidification, then you may very well, um, you'll be better off if you put a desiccant dehumidifier to let it do the difficult dehumidification. And then you can raise the water temperature uh, of your chiller so that you're not having to run it so cold all the time. The hospital example that I showed you in the first one, as I mentioned, they were generally running 42 degree chilled water, sometimes 40, but most of the time 42. Once they put the desiccant dehumidifier there to precondition the outside air, they were able to raise the water temperature from that chiller from 42 to 46 degrees. And that was a big energy savings uh, for that particular hospital. And they no longer, you know, they found that they no longer needed to run a chiller so cold to take care of the sensible load because the, uh, the, the 46 degree water was sufficient to do that in those coils. So hopefully that addressed the last question that you were asked. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Mark. Uh, it was really amazing yes. present, presentation. Uh, I will Thank also you. email you all, it, it, is re it was really amazing presentation. I will Thank email you. you all these questions or participants to you Okay. Uh, you can uh, uh, write the answer in that access sheet and I will forward that sheet to all the participants who have raised the query. Okay. So uh, thanks, Mr. Mark. And uh, I would also like to thank to all the participants uh, who have attended today's presentation on the second dehumidification. Uh, once again, thanks to all the participants and the speaker. Yes, thank you all for, for showing up and thank you for Shalandra for inviting me and best of luck with your particular chapter. Yeah, welcome, sir. Now I'm, I'm going to end this uh, webinar. Thank you.